Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Flinoy. I'm the chair of the Economic Development and Employment Committee. Uh, this meeting of the committee of the Brooklyn uh, Community Board 2 is called to order and it's being recorded for public access and archiving in accordance with New York uh, State Open Meeting Laws. Uh, it is the practice of CB2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members, cameras on. Public attendees are also encouraged to leave the cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking. Uh, to maintain an appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for, for comment by committee members, board members at large and the general public. If you have a question that falls outside of public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel and we'll address them as time permits. Uh, you may also email the district office at any time outside of these meetings. We are committed to providing access for all of our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitations. If you require accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district office 72 hours before public meetings. We ask that those speaking or presenting use plain language, speak at a moderate tone, and frequently ask if you're speaking loud enough. If presenting, read the title of every slide and describe any Im images on the slides, such as photos, graphs, and charts. Uh, with that, we'll now begin the meeting. Uh, may the secretary now read the roll call. Good, e good evening, everyone. Thanks, Bill. I will start the roll call with Chair Bill Flanoy. Mm -hmm. Vice, yes, Chair, <laughs> Vice Chair Denise Peterson. Denise may be running late. Yes. Uh, Catherine Gelman, that's myself. Ronald Cohen. Here. I see you, Ron. Hi. Oleg Geyser. Here. Evening, Oleg. Latrell Masso. Here. Hey, Latrell. Ciro Scala. Here. All right, Maisha Morales. Here. Maisha. Celeste Staten. I don't see Celeste yet. Kate Yearwood Young. No Kate yet. Lindsay Einhorn. She's running late. Running late. And Esther Blunt. Okay. Thank All you very right. much. Oh, there she is. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Um, may I have approval of the agenda? Okay. Uh, Ms. Gilman. Okay. Ms. Morales. Okay. Uh, there's going to be a slight adjustment of the uh, agenda. I'm going to allow the Atlantic Avenue bid to go last since this is the first time uh, you'll be presenting. Okay. So, Jesse, you'll be going last as far as uh, doing presentations here. Okay. Uh, may I have also approval of the minutes from February 22nd? Okay, Ms. Morales. Second. Okay, Mr. Ro uh, Mr. Cohen. If there's any corrections, uh, by all means, please contact the board office. Okay. Uh, at this point in time, uh, I'm going to allow open session for public comment, okay, on the agenda that we're currently discussing today. So if any of the public has any comments uh, about what we're about to discuss about the bids, this is your opportunity. Please raise your hands, either by using the reactions or raising your hand to your screen. Okay, let me just check the chat also. Okay. I see nothing in the chat, no hands raised, and no uh, reactions hands raised. Okay, with that, we'll now begin uh, the, the round table for the business improvement districts. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. This is the second time we're doing this. Uh, this is gonna be wonderful because we're gonna be able to compare what you guys told us last year with what's going on this year. And we'll have an idea how to use these items and suggestions you're making to us for the district statement of mm -hmm. needs that we're gonna be looking at going forward. So with that, I'm gonna go in alphabetical order of the bids, okay? Uh, the first uh, bid we're gonna be looking at uh, since Atlantic Avenue is going last is the uh, Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. 
Hi, thank you. Um, it's funny because this is my first time doing this as well. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Scott Hobbs. I'm the VP of uh, Finance and Operations of the Downtown uh, Brooklyn Partnership. I'm just going to provide a brief overview of some of the work that we've done over the last few months, um, as well as talk of, uh, about some business openings and some statistics that we've shared with our board um, in terms of the recovery. Uh, hold on, I just have to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay. okay, great. Um, so I'm going to start with um, some of our operations. Uh, so uh, this was the most recent snowstorm that we had that hit us one, one weekend. Our guys were out there uh, cleaning the streets. Um, this is a shot down Fulton Mall. Um, as a reminder, uh, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership manages three business improvement districts, including um, Metro Tech, Port Livingston, Skirmerhorn, and the Fulton Mall. Mall. Um, we also, over the last quarter, um, we do this every fall and we're gonna be doing this again in the spring. Um, we work as quickly as possible to, um, to plant new trees. Um, we try to put in trees, uh, we replace dead trees, but we also fill the vacant tree pits around the district. Um, and then on the right side, you can also see um, a picture of a public art installation that we put in, which were haikus by Richard Wright, um, which is, um, there are a bunch all over the district, but this one particular is on the side of the Shake Shack. Um, moving to some reopenings, um, we're very excited to have some reopenings of businesses that have been closed um, uh, for much of the duration of the pandemic. Um, Fulton Hall at the Gotham Market uh, has reopened. Um, Rumble, which is on Red Hook Lane, um, reopened. And the House of Wax, which is located near the Alamo Draft House uh, inside City Point, um, have, have reopened. Um, in terms of new retail, um, we have two locations for a business called Rumi, uh, one in Atlantic Terminal and one at City Point. Um, Five Below um, is about to open on Fulton Mall. And we also had the opening of New York Beauty Suites, which is a kind of co-working space um, that is for um, people in the, in the beauty industry. Um, we also had uh, Taqueria, a new um, taco place open, um, and Sunken Harbor, which is uh, the... Um, which is the bar that's affiliated with Cajun Tolner also opened. Um, I'm just going through these quickly because I'm con conscious of time. Uh, we had a couple of new openings at Decalb Market, um, as well as a new Chinese uh, place uh, called Dragon Eats on Lawrence Street, um, as well as a new bar that opened uh, at Gotham Market called Whatever Forever. Um, the open restaurants program has continued. Um, we have a couple of businesses that have taken advantage of this. Um, it has been successful for those businesses. And um, just last week, we did a, a small business forum um, on Black entrepreneurs in the district um, called um, um, Black Businesses in Brooklyn, or sorry, Building Black Businesses in Brooklyn. Um, and we featured three of our um, business entrepreneurs, including Michelle Cador, who owns the spot um, in City Point, um, and uh, as well as someone from uh, Keith Forrest from New York Beauty Suites, and Delroy Levy from a, a local more jerk, which is located in Decal Market. In terms of events, uh, we had Brooklyn Boo, which is our Halloween event that happens every year on Albee Square outside of City Point. Um, we also also at City Point do the uh, Downtown Brooklyn Gets Lit, which is our tree lighting ceremony. Um, and we had a very successful, despite the very frigid temperatures on uh, Chinese New Year uh, with our lunar uh, celebration outside of City Point. And then most recently, um, just last week, we opened a new art installation, which is a partnership between the Metro Tech Bid, Two Trees, um, as well as the Van Allen Institute. Um, it's called Drive Through. Um, it will feature um, it will feature uh, filmmakers from Brooklyn, um, Black and women, to celebrate Black History Month and Women's History Month. Um, it should conclude at the end of April, and it's at the Plaza at 300 Ashland. Um, looking at some of our statistics, um, this is a chart of pedestrian activity that only goes until December 2021. Um, before you comment, uh, December 20, uh, December is usually a time that we experience a drop-off. We had a more extreme drop-off this year um, 
uh, because of the Omicron variant. Um, we are pleased to see that some of our cameras, although I don't have the statistics here, have rebounded. We have one um, particularly ped count um, outside of Fulton and Hanover that is now back to pre-pandemic levels. And we're very encouraged to keep seeing these trends uh, move higher. Um, looking at some employment trends in the area, downtown Brooklyn, um, this is looking over the past 10 years, we have experienced um, higher growth, um, particularly with firms um, moving to downtown Brooklyn than New York City as a whole, um, and, and Brooklyn overall, and employment is, um, is lower than Brooklyn as a whole, but is higher than the New York City average. Um, with a look to public safety, um, we've had we've reconvened the Metro Tech Public Safety Committee, which is a, a subcommittee of the Metro Tech Board, which now meets monthly uh, along with NYPD to talk about public safety issues. Um, this followed um, some incidents that happened in the fall, and it's just been a great forum um, between our institutional partners, um, some of our board members, um, and the NYPD. So we are continuing them going forward. Um, we've gotten some great feedback on it, and I. Think I think it's it's really helped, um, especially coordinating with uh, NYU Tandon security, Chase's security, as well as our own officers and NYPD on some public safety issues that um, that pop up and arise around the district. And then finally, I just an update on our public realm plan. Um, so one of the aspects and one of the questions that were asked uh, of us before presenting had to do with um, sustainability. Our public realm plan, which is a streetscape plan that we've had approved by the um, Public Design Commission, um, we are going to begin implementation of this plan. And a key component of that is increasing biodiversity um, along the streets. Um, this is with rain gardens to reduce uh, runoff, um, shade, um, uh, that sort of a thing. And we're really pleased to have worked with um, Tishman on their building at 11 Hoyt to do the first implementation of this. Um, this is, you know, looking down Hoyt Street, Livingston and Elm Place. This will surround the district um, with um, permeable pavers to help absorb rainwater. Um, there's going to be new seating opportunities. And we've also, um, Tishman also got their sidewalk extended to create more space for pedestrians. Um, so that is all I have on my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions um, that any of you have. Okay, thank you, Scott. Scott, we're gonna actually hold the questions until okay. after all the bids present. Okay. okay. That way it'll give everyone an equal amount of time. And also some of the questions may apply to all the bids. So we wanna make sure everyone gets the same opportunity. But Great. thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was, that was very good, Scott, for your first time. <laughs> okay, uh, next up, um, Calvis, okay, Director of D uh, Dumbo Improvement District. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Let me just pull my screen up. It's a pleasure to see you all tonight. Happy to, happy to be here and share a little bit about uh, the Dumbo bid and hear about all the other bids. Uh, like Ty said, it's a great chance for us to all get together and share our successes and stories. So uh, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about what's been going on in the last year. Uh, since we last met, you know, our businesses are continuing to struggle through the pandemic, uh, trying to come out of it strong. And so we're trying to lend as much support as we can uh, from, uh, from that perspective. We've been doing a lot of uh, promotion on the street. We've been putting out a lot of advertising using things like QR codes to help promote our local businesses. Uh, let people know who are back in the neighborhood where they can go to find something interesting. Uh, you know, trying to go with some really big messaging, as you can see right here, we're using uh, some really large signage to try to help promote our local restaurants, um, local retailers. Uh, another big thing we've been doing in the last year, we've been working a lot with the city to help uh, put out some PPE to any of the local businesses that need it, uh, putting out masks, uh, as well as sanitizer, face shields, um, et cetera. Uh, on top of the pandemic, uh, our retailers and restaurants have been dealing with uh, construction challenges for the last couple of years. As I'm sure you're aware, we're part of a um, multi-year capital reconstruction project that's affecting a large part of the neighborhood. Um, and that's uh, you know been a huge burden uh, with uh, street closures. Uh, we're looking at a lot of traffic delays in the neighborhood. Um, just a quality of life issue with the noise that's happening all the time. 
um, and, and the visual impact as well. So we've been uh, trying to help mitigate that by working really hard with the um, construction contractors to deal with the traffic flow issues, um, public space management. Uh, one initiative that we put together was putting together these uh, construction fence covers uh, in a large part of the neighborhood to help kind of, you know, draw your eye to something a little more appealing instead of a, a big pile of uh, construction equipment, which uh, we've actually gotten a lot of positive response to. I think it's been quite effective. Uh, from a programming side, uh, we had a very busy year. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, we continued with the Open Streets program on Washington Street, where we had a lot of fun, did a bunch of programming. Um, people seemed to love it. We brought a lot of people to the neighborhood, and uh, it was a rousing success. Open restaurants as well. Uh, I think our last statistic said that uh, I think it was 94% of all of our restaurants participated in the open restaurant program in the district, which is uh, fantastic. I think it really gave them a lot of opportunity to, you know, help make ends meet while they're trying to come out of the pandemic. Another realm we worked with, uh, we worked with uh, downtown Brooklyn uh, with a communal art fund that was uh, funded by the city and the state. Uh, we had a whole bunch of programming related to that. We had a, a shrine intention walk, a non-secular shrine walk uh, between downtown Brooklyn and Dumbo. Uh, we also painted a whole bunch of new murals in the neighborhood. We had a, a Say Adams come in and do a mural. Uh, we also had this really beautiful uh, piece installed by Marka 27, as well as Sophia Dawson uh, right down under the Manhattan Bridge. Uh, on top of that, we kind of really tried to return uh, the events to the neighborhood, as I mentioned. We, uh, you know, programmed the Archway all summer. We had a lot of fun. Uh, we did a whole bunch of programming as well on Washington Street with our six-foot platform, which was a great opportunity for all sorts of interactive art uh, to be displayed. And uh, I've got just a quick little video if you guys would like to see some of the stuff that happened. Sorry, I must have that on loop. Apologies. Uh, on top of uh, some more of the events in the Archway, we had a whole series of music programming. We worked with Carnegie Hall to put on a couple of shows with uh, Hazmat Modine and Slavic Soul Party. Uh, Brazil Summerfest, another partner of ours that comes back most years. Uh, we did a whole festival with them, as well as the uh, Brooklyn Americana Music Festival uh, that was back for its eighth year, I believe. Um, uh, outside of our events, we definitely spent a lot of time trying to help support our businesses as well with new programming. A new initiative that we partnered with uh, Two Trees uh, involved uh, Shop the Studios, which was a chance for local artists to open their studios up and uh, have people come and visit and gave them an opportunity to sell their art on the spot, which was also uh, very successful for, for most artists. We also did some local small business promotion, putting out holiday bows over the, uh, over the holiday season uh, with little gift tags highlighting uh, some of our, uh, well, not some, but uh, most of our uh, small businesses in the neighborhood. I think we put out uh, almost 70 bows. Uh, we also spent some time trying to motivate the workforce to come back with uh, some promotions. Um, we would uh, offer what we called perks in person, uh, giving local uh, workforce uh, uh, free coffee or uh, donuts, cookies, as well as offering uh, Dumbo dollars uh, that they could spend in the neighborhood. So it was a great way to combine uh, bringing the local workforce back and helping them support the local uh, businesses as well. We also partnered with the Vinegar Hill Food Pantry for the last two years to help uh, you know, bring food to those uh, in need in the neighborhood, which was uh, uh, kind of an unexpected relationship that blossomed out of the pandemic, which uh, we're really happy to be a part of. 
Uh, so looking forward to the future, I'm sorry, I hope I haven't taken up uh, too much time. Um, we're looking at the Brooklyn Bridge Anchorage uh, in the neighborhood that's uh, supposed to be uh, let go by Parks Department and Department of Transportation in the next couple of years, and we're hoping to bring that back to a, uh, to a public plaza. Uh, we're also looking forward to the Dumbo Drop, uh, our local fundraiser for our, uh, for our public schools, PS307 and the Dock Street School, and that'll be happening this year on May 21st. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing everyone on the uh, on Washington Street, so I invite you all to join us. We're coming back this summer with programming as well, and uh, we're not going to have daily programming like last year, but we're definitely uh, we're pushing a lot of uh, our successful programming, including the drink and draw that you can see right here that happened uh, weekly in the archway. Uh, so this is the point where uh, I know Taya said, uh, Taya, sorry, Taya said that, uh, you know, we don't, uh, we don't ask too much at this meeting, but uh, you know, one thing I always want to mention is that we're still pushing really hard on um, the F train uh, and the second entrance that we're trying to get at York Street Station. So anytime uh, the Community Board 2 is able to help push that agenda, we'd be happy to, you know, uh, to come together on that. As well as thinking about the uh, BQE uh, redesign and the Brooklyn Strand, uh, you know, over the next 10, 15 years, there's going to be a lot of change happening in the neighborhood, and uh, we hope that we can work together to make sure that the the development that happens uh, creates more green space, uh, better connections for public transit and micro mobility, and uh, just a healthier environment for everyone. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, just some of those items you mentioned, the Strand, the BQE, and also, um, for the most part, the York Street Station is number one, I think, for one of the things we're doing for development in Dumbo. So, uh, Absolutely. Thank you, Travis, for uh, emphasizing those are some of the things we're looking there, at. We've, we've lost your mic. Oh, you have lost my, do you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Calvis, we're definitely behind those three items, okay? Okay, next on the agenda is Fulton Area Business Alliance. Uh, that's Christina. Hi, okay, let's see. Okay, great. Uh, so just going through a, a few few slides and these are a recap of some of our major um, initiatives and the work that we did over the past year. Uh, so this, this is Fulton Street on the Fort Greene end of our, our district. And then just a reminder of our district boundary. So we cover Fulton Street from Rockwell Place in Fort Greene to Classen Avenue on the Clinton Hill side. Uh, we also work with DOT as a maintenance partner for two of the public plazas, the existing plazas, Fowler Square at Lafayette and um, Fulton, and then G2 Roussy at Grand and Fulton in Clinton Hill. Uh, one thing, uh, just thinking forward for the next year, we are working with DOT and some uh, additional community partners for a third plaza in the district, which would be pretty much smack in the middle at Vanderbilt, Gates Avenue, and Fulton, um, which some of you may know is um, the Appalines Garden um, Potential Plaza Project. Um, so if we put forward the application, we will be working with, with DOT and would be um, in charge of maintenance for that space as well too. So in general, just covering you know, about a mile and a half um, of the district, representing 400 businesses and property owners. And just some quick stats in terms of um, the number of storefronts occupied at last count, we were at 196. Uh, about 69% of those are um, some type, um, minority woman owned or business um, enterprise. And some of them are um, you know, more than one category as well, um, women owned, black owned business businesses. Um, and I would say one, one issue that we're definitely still struggling with in the district is a pretty high vacancy rate. And one thing that I would love to discuss more with the, with the committee and um, kind of working with our city partners, um, some of these vacancies do come from some pretty new, um, larger development, uh, new development projects where they take up a very large footprint in the district um, and have just remain empty retail storefronts now going on multiple years on end where the property owners are really just 
holding out for what they see as their like ideal tenant. But that really has a um, detriment to the to the community and for the district to have so many of these empty retail spaces. Um, and we are, especially on the Clinton Hill side, you know, we have a number of pretty large new development projects coming in. So between the high vacancy rate, active construction sites, um, you know, the the conditions on the street level um, are not always the, the friendliest and, and um, easiest for people um, walking and biking in the district. So just a highlight of some of the work that we've done over the past year for um, small business support, um, obviously the PPE distribution, working with um, our city agency partners from SBS, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce that have helped us and some of our own like sponsorship to get um, face masks and hand sanitizer distributed. I feel like that's been really helpful for us just to have that constant daily, weekly touching base with businesses. You know, what do you need? What can we provide for you? Here's something um, a little extra on behalf of us in the city. That, that's been really, that's been really helpful. Um, and just getting, getting the word out about any regulation changes, um, new, City guidelines that are updated. You know, we're always looking for opportunity for that real, like, high impact, one-on-one um, -on -one, um, touching base with the businesses in the district. And then, otherwise, like we, some of the marketing that we do. This is some highlights over the past year, which some of them we just we just wrapped up again for the second year. The small business sweetie campaign, which we did in partnership with some of the other bids on the call. So that was really great to bring that back again. Uh, for Women's History Month, you know, we highlighted a number of the women-owned businesses in the district, and you know, we're now getting prepared for kind of like what we're going to do a little bit differently this year. Maybe some more like video highlights, of really amplifying folks on social media, and um, also a lot of our businesses that aren't as um, technology and like digitally savvy. Like, how can we help promote them as well too through our channels? And events, I would say last summer um, was really amazing to bring back a lot of our um, premier, like bigger events for the season that we weren't able to do in 2020. So that's in, that included our Jazz 966 concert series that we do in partnership with the Fort Greene Council um, Senior Center on Fulton Street. Um, so that was really amazing to see the seniors and the older adults in our community to come out and feel very comfortable and safe doing these activities again. and. So that was a great attendance and we're hoping to double the number of concerts that we can do and and this photo here we do it at uh g2uc plaza in, in clinton hill um and then our art 360 event um which we do every year in fort green for like um art pop-up and uh in-person experiences uh last year we brought that event to Clinton Hill for the first year. And that was really fun. Um, and then our movie series that we do in partnership with, with BAM. And of course, streetscape and sanitation, uh, a big part of the work that we do, especially at our public plaza spaces. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, now bringing on a potential third plaza space in the district is definitely something that will be a big, um, a big initiative for us going forward into 2022 and making sure that we have um, enough city support and um, adequate staffing to make to maintain all of these spaces that are very uh, actively used and, and loved in the in the community. And follow us on social media, <laughs> I'd say, um, just in terms of like some some other urgent issues um, and just concerns that we're hearing from businesses. Um, definitely some quality of life um, concerns for sure of businesses um, just kind of struggling with um, an increased number of um, unhoused population um, in the district, um, aggressive panhandling, um, open like, people that are very vis visibly struggling with mental health and substance abuse. Um, so how do we balance um, kind of making sure that the people in, in CB2 and in greater Brooklyn area, um, you know, are really getting the support services that they need? Um, because I think our, our that on a day to day basis, you know, is what I hear the most of from, from the businesses in terms of like, you know, we wanna make sure that 
Fulton Street is, is welcoming and, and people know that we're here and want to, to come out and support us. Um, so we're gonna continue working with our, um, the precinct and you know, our new council member. Um, so that would definitely be a, another um, focus of ours over the next year as well too. I'll pause there, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, yes, the quality of life issues is definitely something that the community board is concerned about. We tend to bring it up on a regular basis since it's, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's gonna be one of the questions I was gonna ask the bids, the rest of the bids also. So thank you. Okay, um, next up is the Montague Street bid. Uh, that's Kate Chura. Mr. Klumenag, uh Kate is not able to be with us this evening. Oh, she's not, okay. Uh, then uh, let's move on to the Myrtle Avenue uh, bid and that's uh, Chad. Great. Yeah, thank you. Oh, there you go. Um, I will take it away. Um, I have a few slides here to go through. Um, give me one second. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to you know take a moment to talk. And it's a nice, as others have said, it's a nice opportunity for all the our big colleagues here to convene and, and um, always hear and learn from each other. So thank you to the committee for the opportunity. Um, just a really brief overview um, of who we are as an organization, as a bid, um, I'll, I'll give that as well as just a look back over the last year and, and some of the work that we've been up to and some of the pressing needs that we have for our, our businesses on Myrtle. Um, so our bid runs along Myrtle Avenue between Blackbush and Classen, covering everything in Fort Greene and Clinton Hill. Um, in terms of what we do, it's you know, similar to the other bids where we actually care for the physical space on Myrtle Avenue and support our businesses in a number of ways, uh, host free events and uh, operate a number of other programs that serve local residents. All this work is directed by uh, uh, quite a number of different stakeholders in the community um, who serve on our board, um, our staff, a lot of different partner organizations. Uh, but all this work is really centered around supporting the small business community that we have on Myrtle. We have 180 different business members in our bid. Um, if you take a look back in 2021, um, just to give a really quick snapshot, we had 12 new businesses sign leases uh, for storefronts on Merle Avenue with eight of them opening last year, a few more still in the works. Uh, and we also had a dozen businesses close. In terms of how that looks sort of pre-pandemic, um, it's a little sort of lopsided or contrast to what we saw in 2019. Um, where we saw a lot more lease openings um, this past year compared to then, but we also had a lot more closings. Um, so it's the picture is a little all over the place in that regard. Um, in terms of who our businesses are, um, currently uh, just about three quarters of them are women or minority owned enterprises. Um, about eight and 10 are independently owned or mom and pop shops. That's roughly the same as where we were pre-pandemic. Those numbers have held steady for the last 15 years, but it is declining um, slightly. Um, in terms of our vacancy on the avenue, um, we saw the vacancy rate go down um, over the last few years, which was great. Um, uh, that goes in tandem with more businesses opening, of course. Um, at the moment, we have 18 storefronts currently available on the avenue available for rent. Um, and you know, I think just due to the pandemic and obviously the change in conditions on the street or in the economy, um, our asking, our median asking price uh, for leases has, has dipped slightly uh, from pre-pandemic to now. In terms of supporting our businesses, there's obviously a lot of technical assistance support that we can provide um, to our smart business owners and that covers sort of a lot of different things. Um, but another way that we're really proud that we can be of support is to get money to our businesses, uh, particularly during the pandemic. Um, so that's through some internal grant programs that we've operated uh, for many years, but um, we're able to expand during the pandemic, but also connecting to other partnerships like the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce through their Bring Back Brooklyn Fund. Um, so on the heels of the pandemic over that first um, year, year and a half, we were able to connect nearly $60,000 to our business owners uh, to help with a variety of things, whether it's storefront improvements or local hiring. Uh, so really proud of that uh, ability to funnel money to our small businesses. Um, speaking of the local hiring, we have a summer youth employment program that has been in operation for over a decade now. Um, last year, it's really exciting that we were able to double that uh, in terms of the number of students that we were able to serve. Uh, so 10 different businesses employed 20 local high schoolers. Um, and then we also were able to pivot that program to be year round, with, so it's currently in process now actually, so it's not just relegated to the summer. Uh, we have that going on indefinitely at the moment. Um, and that's made possible through a partnership with, this, with the mayor's office uh, for anti-gun violence. Um, they have an employment program connected 
um, to that initiative. Um, and then speaking of hiring, we also have a Myrtle Avenue job board where we will post local opportunities um, from local businesses. That's been going on for a number of years on our website, but um, during the pandemic, and as, as you know, across the country, small business owners were really struggling with staffing and finding qualified workers. Um, so we wanted to figure out how we could really make that more robust. Um, so we created a paper version of the job board, printed it in um, you know, uh, two languages and have them out on the street and also shared with uh, specific local partners in the neighborhood that can help sort of message them out to their communities. Um, and then in terms of city services, I know that was one of the questions the committee was interested in. I just wanted to give a snapshot of where we are today compared to where we are were maybe in the height of the pandemic. Um, in terms of sanitation, we've seen our DSNY service go back up to more normal levels. We're dealing a lot less now than we were six months ago with um, illegal dumping or delayed pickups of trash on the corner. So I'm happy to report that, that cleanliness issues have definitely improved. Um, if we look at safety, the police department, we know that they're dealing with staffing issues at the local precinct level. Um, from our business owners, we're hearing that as well. We're hearing delayed response times to 911 calls. Sometimes it can take two hours to report, uh, you know, for them to report to an assault. Um, and we're also hearing more from our businesses that they would just really appreciate more foot patrols from the police, uh, from the local precinct. In terms of just inspections, we haven't had too many issues from our business owners. I think it's just sort of standard uh, traffic of inspections coming from different city agencies. And it's a lot of warnings, which is appreciated um, instead of just um, giving fines. Um, but then to some of the others, uh, to echo some of the others points, the social or sort of lack of social services is really impacting our small businesses. They're dealing with an uptick of more individuals who are really high need. They're coming into the businesses um, you know, emotionally distressed um, or, you know, they're just coming in with harassing staff, customers, um, committing crimes. Um, so that's definitely an uptick and it's taking a toll on our small businesses and sort of the lack of resources that they can call to address those issues in real time. Um, a lot of them are interested in having police alternatives because a lot of those situations don't require um, police to get involved. Um, that's really a high level issue for our business owners right now. Um, that was the high level info that I wanted to share, but while I have your attention, just to give a really quick highlight of some of the other things that we've been up to over the last year and always is promoting our small businesses. So we create um, printed materials that will go out like our holiday guide that we mailed to 50,000 local households last Christmas or last December. Um, also hosting events throughout the year um, that draw people to the avenue, whether it's you know, holiday events or, or those throughout the summer, um, events that will showcase local art and creativity. Um, we did a number of public art installations last year to help bring some color and liveliness to the avenue. In addition to that beautification, you know, we're doing a lot of different horticultural work, maintaining our Myrtle Avenue Plaza space in Clinton Hill. Our crews are out there every day of the year picking up trash, removing graffiti, all that good stuff, um, keeping the avenue clean as best we can, keeping it festive during the holiday season. And also, in addition to all that work that we do directly on Myrtle Avenue and supporting our businesses, we have a number of other community programs like our food pantry, which has been going strong since 2015, it's still operating weekly, really focused on serving households in the Fort Greene NYCHA developments, all four of them. So currently we're serving about 2,000 households a month by providing free groceries every Saturday. Um, and all this work is carried out by an amazing team of people who, work, who I get to work alongside every day. Um, so they're making it all happen. That's it. Thanks. Good. Thank you, Chad. Okay. Uh, and thank you for answering some of the questions that are already coming up. Uh, next, okay, we have, um, okay, North Flatbush Avenue. Okay, Hi, Kira. how's it going? I'm Theo Bokshevsky. I'm the program manager for the North Flatbush Avenue bid. Um, our executive director, James Ellis, was not able to make it tonight. I know that many of you know him. Um, and apologies, I don't actually have a presentation. Um, this is our first time doing this, but next time. Um, so the North Flatbush Avenue bid, uh, we represent businesses along Flatbush Avenue from Grand Army Plaza to Atlantic Avenue. Uh, we also capture some of the side streets, uh, namely businesses along the triangular intersections of Flatbush and a few storefronts onto Bergen and Dean Street. Um, we run directly along the border between Park Slope and Prospect Heights. Um, we are 36 years old, um, so one of the oldest bids. We were founded in 1986 um, and we 
pride ourselves on being a small but mighty bid. Um, so we have a relatively small assessment. Uh, the board has always kind of tried to kept, keep the burden light, um, financial burden light on businesses and property owners. Um, so between James and myself, we have roughly one full-time staff person. Um, we're an interesting, unique commercial district, um, Flatbush being a major thoroughfare for automobiles and also a hub of public transit. Um, so we do capture a lot of customers as they were passing through in transit. The landscape of our district really changes as you move along Flatbush towards Barclays Center uh, with businesses closer to Barclays, especially in recent years, really catering towards that stadium audience um, and folks coming off of the Atlantic Avenue Barclays subway stop. Um, we've seen lots of changes and developments in recent years, especially with uh, the Atlantic Yards development along Atlantic just northeast of the district. Um, in regards to services, we do uh, supplemental street and sidewalk sweeping. Uh, we have one staff person seven days a week, uh, graffiti removal. We advocate for capital improvements. Um, so in the last few years, we've um, had some pedestrian safety upgrades um, in the district, so curb bump outs. Um, and we also redid um, the Triangle Parks at 6th Avenue, 7th Avenue in Carlton um, with 8th Avenue to come in the next year. Uh, we also continue to service our district's green and clean program uh, that maintains about 50 planters um, with juvenile trees planted, uh, planted. And we look forward to doing another planting installation at the Triangle Green Streets in the district. Um, promotion and, and events, we do regular marketing support, um, social media promotion of our businesses and a few dedicated annual campa campaigns, including the Small Business Sweeties campaign in partnership with bids around the city. Um, we've been highlighting black owned businesses during Black History Month and um, we'll look forward to highlighting some women owned businesses in the next month. We have a few larger annual events that we put on. Um, we do an Earth Day Festival. Um, we do our Hot Sounds of Summer. Um, Make Music New York Street Festival. Um, so we do the street festival and then we also act at work with our businesses to activate their storefronts with live music every year on June 21st. Um, we do our annual Fall Fest um, kind of petered out during COVID and we've sort of revived it um, as regular Wednesday evening programming during the month of October. So we've done live music at the Sixth Avenue Triangle. And then our big annual winter solstice event also in partnership with Make Music New York is Flatfoot Flatbush is a music and dancing parade along Flatbush Avenue. Um, in regards to turnover statistics since COVID, uh, our district saw 13 permanent closures and one temporary um, as a result of a fire. Morgan's Barbecue will be reopening in the next few months. Um, 13 permanent closures during COVID. Um, we've had nine openings, um, but we are also anticipating six more openings coming soon. Um, so once those business open, our vacancy rate will actually be lower than pre-pandemic, uh, which is exciting. In terms of what we've seen from businesses, um, We've seen that restaurants and food businesses fared all right. Um, a lot of restaurants did well with the takeout. Um, we find that the demographic of Park Slope Prospect Heights um, tended to be working from home. Um, so they were actually in the neighborhood more than they normally would be if they were commuting into the city for work. Um, so a lot of our businesses sort of benefited from having that customer base present. Um, we saw the businesses they were able to transition to online sales and really actively engaged in social media um, were able to kind of elicit more empathy and thus more patronage during the pandemic. Only a few of our businesses participated in the open streets program just because of the challenges of setting up along Flatbush Avenue, which is not very accommodating for street seating. Um, recently, the North Flatbush bid co-hosted the Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development Council Crossroads Conversation, uh, which is a community discussion about the state of the Atlantic Yards project, um, really about trying to hold developers accountable for completing the project's proposed um, affordable housing units. So I'm actually gonna share the link to that in the chat. Um, and folks are still welcome to read and um, review and give commentary on that. Um, we're especially interested to see what happens to site five, uh, which is the Models and PC Richards uh, locations that has yet to be determined. Um, I'll share quickly just some district challenges. Our district actually kind of just juts into a community, community board two. Um, so we're just sort of the southwest tip of the district as part of um, CB2. Um, but sort of specifically in that area, uh, we have been having some traffic challenges at the corner of Flatbush and Pacific. Um, there's two big fast food chains there and kind of due to new customer hammocks coming out of the pandemic and a lot of folks ordering delivery, um, there is, has been a buildup of delivery vehicles, sometimes like 30 bike delivery people out on the sidewalk, um, which is impeding pedestrian traffic. Um, but then also delivery car pickup, um, creating uh, automobile traffic. And so we've been trying to figure out how to deal with that as sort of a temporary solution. The 78th precinct has sectioned off just a portion of that lane um, for those delivery delivery bikes to just kind of be as they're waiting for their pickups. 
but then and that's also obviously creating some traffic issues. Um, so we kind of want to get all interested parties together to discuss a more long term solution for this. Um, how can we kind of create a new bar paradigm for better use of that public space? Maybe it's a capital solution, redesigning curb space, maybe it's a regulation solution. Um, so that's something that we're still kind of trying to work with um, all interested parties on. Also in sort of kind of in relation to that and those two sort of major fast food chains right there, we've had some sanitation issues in that area, um, specifically just lots of debris, uh, customers just throwing their trash on the sidewalk. Um, that's been a particular uh, issue with the community garden, which is right across from Pacific, uh, directly across from Barclays, has seen a lot of um, rodent issues as a result of that. So we're working um, with those businesses to purchase and site um, and maintain additional trash cans in that space. So we um, are waiting for Department of Sanitation approval on those locations. Um, in general, I think traffic enforcement is um, something that we are hoping to um, work with the 70th, uh, 78th precinct on. Um, Flatbush Avenue, very busy automobile street. We have um, uh, curb lane closures on opposite sides of the street. So the lane traveling into the city from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. on the east side, um, there is no parking. And then from 4 to 7 p.m. on the west side coming back from the city. Um, but often cars are parked there and we haven't seen much enforcement. So we're um, hoping to see more of that. And then also we have a lot of issues with cars just blocking the box, like trying to make it through a yellow light and not quite getting there, which causes gridlock. Um, some of those traffic issues have been exacerbated by construction. Um, there's a water main construction going on right now on Flatbush and Sterling. Um, coming up in the future, um, we are looking at a redistricting uh, to more equi equitably assess uh, some of the properties in our district and capture all of the new development that come that's coming in. So in the last year or so, we've been working with some students at Hunter College um, to do some surveying of stakeholders to sort of understand the potential impact of redistricting and how to cre create a formula that sort of works for everyone. Um, events coming up, we have our Earth Day Festival on April 22nd. On May 21st, uh, we celebrate Bike to Work Day. Um, so we'll be handing out treats and working with the 78th Precinct to register bikes in the morning of May 21st. And then on June 21st, we have our annual Make Music New York um, event. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deodora. That's awesome. Okay, we're gonna have questions for you. Okay, and last but not least, uh, Jesse uh, with the Atlantic Avenue bid. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Jesse Garrick. I'm the executive director at Atlantic Avenue Bid as of December. So it's all gonna be fresh and new. <laughs> um, one thing, quick correction. I looked at the deck from last year. Um, we are no longer operating collectively with the Montague Bid. Um, Kate's not here. We're still friends, but we're not operating collectively anymore. Um, so we are an organization of just the Atlantic Avenue Bid. We work also with the LTC um, a bit. Um, so that under that, uh, just the Atlantic Avenue bid, not the Montague bid, we have three, about 341 businesses in operation right now um, with roughly, uh, I think it's 400 storefronts. So we have a lot, we have a vacancy issue right now. It's like 15 to 20%, I believe. Um, still working on getting accurate numbers on that, but it's around 15 to 20%. We have some, uh, and some pretty large spaces uh, plus 5,000 square feet. We had Barney's was here. And then when they closed down, they left a pretty large space. Um, so we operate between uh, 4th Avenue and Hicks on Atlantic Avenue. Um, we also uh, have a couple of side streets between State and um, Pacific, which are Bond, Hoyt, and Smith. Um, yeah, that pretty much tells the story. We don't have um, the one section there between uh, Court and Clinton, which is, I believe, actually downtown Brooklyn partnership. It's kind of odd, but that's, that's how it works. So that blue block right there in the center, that's not actually technically part of the bid. Um, and uh, anyhow, so we have, we do have some, despite the high vacancy rate, some new openings that we're pretty happy with. Um, assembly line recently closed. They're kind of like a high-end design firm that uh, work with the General Assembly. Um, we have DM Eatery, we have, and we have a live music menu called The Atlantic that just opened uh, like last month. Um, let me see, we also, uh, since I came on board and this was also in the works already, we did a group RFP with a lot of other bids to do a new sanitation contract. Um, result of that, we switched to a company called Block by Block. 
um, we saw an uptick, I think, in graffiti, and we felt that this uh, vendor would better um, serve that those issues we had with with an uptick of graffiti during COVID. Um, let me see what else we got here. Um, so we recently, this past summer, did a rebranding of the logo. Um, and that is also going to lead to a relaunch of our website. Um, it probably wouldn't be helpful to share our website right now. It is badly out of date and it's basically a place for misinformation, I'm kind of considering making it not public anymore at this point. <laughs> but it's got our Instagram, which our Instagram is awesome. We're doing a great job on Instagram right now. Um, so that relaunch will, we're hoping to uh, have by May or June of this year. We're working on it as, uh, as I'm speaking, basically. Um, so yeah, um, recent uh, campaigns we've done as well are, as Christina mentioned, we were part of the uh, Small Business Sweetie Valentine's Day um, uh, campaign this past month. Um, and we also did a Black History Month campaign as well um, that highlighted all of our uh, Black owned businesses. Um, previous to my tenure, we also did in the fall a uh, open studios. We have a lot of galleries um, in the district. We had an open studio, 17 businesses also participated. We have a lot of businesses that like to, uh, that have art on their walls. So we brought in, um, we highlighted that um, along with some of the galleries that we have. Um, I see, what else? Um, so challenges or issues, we can discuss some of those. We've had some issues with break-ins in, in, in my short time, um, not during the day, these are you know, break-ins during the night. Um, and uh, we've also, a big topic is the BQE design that Calvis brought up. The effect for us is that the two lanes of traffic, that's three lanes of traffic, has been closed down to two lanes of traffic. So we're getting a lot of truck traffic because we are truck thoroughway. Um, and, uh, so that's adding to our truck traffic, which is already um, quite heavy to begin with. Um, Another issue is the uh, street lighting. We have four lanes of traffic. So um, traffic calming in general is a big topic. It's been one before I came on board and it's one that we're continuing to uh, try to find uh, interventions for. Um, let me see, lighting is one as well. Um, we have historic lighting that um, 10 years ago, this bid kind of made a, had a contract with the DOT that ended up with us owning some vintage street lights, which turns out are incredibly costly to maintain. And if we could go back in time, we might want to undo that contract. But it's it's ours for now, and and for it continues to be. Um, it turns out it's yeah, it's quite a difficult thing to solve. And um, but we're looking to figure out alternative ways to get more lighting on the street because. Without those vintage lights, which the DOT I think considers are decorative, but the difference is quite quite um, real if you're on the if you're on the, the sidewalks um, along our corridor. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up there, but I'm open to answering any questions that I can possibly answer right now. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jesse. Um, before I open up the questions to the committee and then following the board. Uh, is there any challenges that any of the bids have not brought up that you want to bring up now after hearing other individuals discuss them? Because this is something we need to know going forward. Uh, when we do the district statement of needs, we need to know what challenges you're facing so we can also represent them. Uh, Carvis, Calvis, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks, Phil. No worries. I think um, <laughs> I guess something that was uh, tangentially related uh, and some people mentioned is that uh, we need more support from the 84th. Uh, I know I've heard from them themselves that they've been uh, kind of underfunded, not underfunded, but they haven't gotten any new officers uh, out of the last couple of um, graduate, I don't know exactly how to say this, the graduates from the police academy, no one's gone to the 84th. So they're really struggling to get more officers on the street. And most of our quality of life issues are traffic issues that we need them to help us with they want to help us with, but they just don't have the capacity. So I think that would be a, a great thing to, you know, help push from the community board side. Okay, is there anything else? 
Okay, uh, Theodora. Uh, if uh, I mispronounce your name, I apologize. <laughs> no, it's okay. I go by Theodora or Theo, whatever, whatever works better. Um, no, just sort of along the lines of sanitation issues. I know that I had sort of mentioned one specific issue, but we also have a lot of issues in our district with um, improper disposal. Um, so just residents um, leaving bags of trash outside of our um, trash cans. Illegal dumping or just basically overflow? Um, it's improper disposal. Illegal dumping, I believe the definition is that you have to actually be taking something large out of a truck. Um, that there's like, the, yeah, there's a, there's a little discrepancy. We don't, we don't see too much of that. Um, there's actually an illegal dumping reward program um, where you can get a significant cash reward if you report it. Um, it we deal more with just improper disposal, um, which is less of a fine or a penalty, um, but it's still annoying. <laughs> no, yes, it is. Uh, anything else? Um, I would say we, we also have a problem uh, with in, improper disposal um, in parts of our district. Um, and then there was something else that I wanted to mention that I can't think of right now. Um, and we've I had a problem. I, I mean, it was mentioned before, but um, with with um, people with uh, mental health issues and emotionally disturbed, bothering patrons on the on the side of the street, um, especially with the open restaurants, the few that we do have, we have gotten complaints from um, businesses, and some of them have even talked about hiring private security because they can't get any response from the NYPD. I was just going to tack on to that and what Calvis was saying. The one thing I forgot to mention related to the safety issue is, you know, uh, an issue that relates to the DA's office and, you know, Denise and, and the other bids, like we've been speaking about this, um, you know, a number of our bids, they will experience somebody who's repeatedly coming in to harass staff or commit a crime. Um, that person is then arrested, but then they reappear, you know, a couple of days later or later in the week to then commit the same crime against the same staff or customers. So obviously that's not a sustainable way to be operating a community, let alone a business. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, when, when we are not able as a you know system, as a collective city to be able to connect the right resources for these individuals. Um, so that's it. And then, so to that end, some of our businesses have started to hire private security as of late. Okay. Oh, and I'm sorry, I just wanna add one more thing. Um, I know, I'm sure Regina has mentioned this before when meeting with this committee, but we also have a huge problem, especially around a lot of the government buildings with placard abuse, um, blocking um, pedestrian walkways, um, sometimes uh, within our um, bulb outs um, for our shared street program, um, and it blocks deliveries to a lot of the businesses as well. I so this is Christina, just very quickly in terms of the um, traffic and just congestion, um, Fulton Street, you know, it's, it's really, that's some, something else I've been hearing a lot, not just from the businesses, but from the residents in our district and um, in working with DOT for this potential plaza, we're like, we're really pushing them to consider safety improvements, not just in that one particular location, but like along Fulton Street, on Atlantic, on Gates, like trying to think more um, holistically about the whole area and addressing um, further improvements for like pedestrians, bikes, um, and so forth. Thank you. We need this. Please, if there's anything else you can think of, let us know before we do the district statement of needs. Now, the other thing I wanna ask you is recovery challenges. What recovery challenges do you think you're gonna face over the next year? Just pop in popcorn, doesn't matter. You've been, you're doing it already, just keep doing it. I think still getting the return of services to the level they were at DSNY in particular, making sure that, you know, every once in a while, we're still getting missed pickups, uh, especially on recycling, which can be a big pain because it's a whole week before they come back. So just trying to make sure that everything kind of returns to the levels they were at. Okay. Anyone else? I would say, I mean, for us, you know, <clears throat> the pandemic is obviously still ongoing for our small business, for many people, but for our small business owners, right? And since I would say the summer of 2020, I've been saying to myself, oh, when's the other shoe going to drop, right? Like, when are we going to see a wave of closures of businesses, you know, in our neighborhoods or on Myrtle Avenue? We haven't seen that yet, but um, that's not to say that it's still not going to happen, but, you know, burnout is real. And I think that's, that's impacting our business owners. Um, you know, business owners are like any other profession, right? Like you, you will quit your job and move on to something else um, when you want to do that personally. Um, so just sharing that I think, you know, it's been a lot, right, to run a business for the last two years. Um, and so my concern is, you know, when are people gonna be throwing in the towel? Um, because you know, most of our businesses still aren't back to, you know, 100% of their revenue that they were bringing in in 2019. A lot of them are still operating at reduced capacity. So I think that's a real issue. 
Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I would say one of the business challenges we're having specifically is around Metro Tech with all the office that we have there. Um, we don't have a lot of the workers coming back. And so, I mean, if when you looked at the, when I showed that slide of our pedestrian counts, I mean, it's the office district that has the lowest growth and the lowest return. And the, uh, the businesses that serve that community, um, whether they're like a coffee kiosk or they're they're doing really horribly. Um, and then the businesses that are around, you know, where the Target and the Trader Joe's are, which didn't close at all, are doing much better. Um, and we've seen that bear out in, in our numbers as well. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I've noticed that also. Okay. And I don't know if that's going to turn around, even though the mass policies are being relaxed. Okay. Uh, anything else before I turn it over to the committees? Um, I'll just say that just to follow up on, on Chad's point about the, the frustration from businesses, you know, I definitely hear that from, especially from some of our longer um, owned business owner, business owners here. And, you know, in terms of like the open restaurants program, just feeling like they're constantly like getting cited for something, but then they'll complain that like their, that their neighbor isn't getting cited. So it's just um, the conditions of trying to operate a small business in the city is um, just that increasing frustration is, is very real. Okay, thank you. Yeah, tagging uh, on to what Christina said, um, you know, I think some of our businesses have had issues with people sort of hanging out in their outdoor dining sheds when they're closed um, and causing issues for neighbors and getting 311 complaints. Um, so we've really just been trying to share out the messaging um, to residents to um, try and engage with the business owner before immediately just going to 311 um, because when you file a 311 complaint, then it just say send enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is this is very helpful to us to, to know these items and things. Okay, uh, committee members, does anyone have any questions? Okay, it's Ms. Morales. Hi, I have questions for three of the bids. Uh, the first would be, uh, Christina, thank you for your, uh, I really appreciated your honesty, right? And, and some of the issues that are having happening along Fulton Street, uh, especially with, and I agree with you, these new developments that take a larger amount of street space and keep their storefronts closed. Um, I, I, the, one of the first buildings ever built on Fulton Street, I don't know if BAM owns it, but it's right next to the BAM Harvey Theater on Ashland and, and Fulton. That building has been built now over 10, 15 years, and they have not rented out their bottom space, uh, retail space. So that's, I guess, now the question is, have you spoken with local officials, uh, the local public officials, to see what role they can play? Because that is becoming very problematic with all these new developments and keeping their spaces empty because they're looking for the right uh, client. Right, exactly. Um, I would say this is definitely a topic that I've discussed uh, with Council Member Hudson, and um, you know, I'm hoping that through the new wave of council members um, across the city, that maybe we can get some progress on. Um, I don't know if it's a commercial um, rent regulations. You know, what what kind of what can we do to really make the retail space, especially of these newer buildings, um, not the afterthought in what they're what they're developing because I know just from my past experience like working with developers in a lot of these projects you know they're very focused on the residential piece and like the ground floor retail space and kind of like their impact on the street level is a is a secondary um so how do we change that conversation um and come at it from the the neighborhood perspective um so definitely looking forward to working with her and her office on that great thank you and Scott from the downtown Brooklyn partnership um and I know you, you also said this is your first time, not sure if you were around. The last time I believe in the fall when the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership talked about some of the issues and creating this community safety forum. Um, one of the things I had asked and suggested was as they were talking about who would be included in this forum, they talked about you know small businesses, landlords and the residentials the residents that live more in these luxury developments. And I had asked if they, you know, they could include 
NYCHA residents, specifically NYCHA leaders, because they can get impacted by this as well. As it, it's, um, we can go on and on and talk about why, right? Tend to be more public housing, people of color tend to be targeted when we talk about policing. And I felt it was important that they be in that conversation. In fact, we have one of our NYCHA resident leaders here on this call, and she's also our district leader for 8057. But so I was wondering, are they included? If not, can that still be a possibility? And then the second thing, which is really important, uh, between, on Ashland, when it turns into Hanson Place between the Apple Store and where the actual mall begins in front of the food trucks, there is a dangerous hole that's been on that sidewalk for years. People are falling every day. The vendors keep talking about how, in fact, recently one lady was walking with her dog. She fell, busted her face open. She fell on top of her dog. People are falling and getting hurt, especially seniors on a daily basis. I've reported it to DOT. I've reported it everywhere. Nothing's been done. Two Trees says it's not part of their property. The owners of uh, the mall say it's not part of their property. It's right in that. Do you know where the, the Caesars, the empanada truck is at? There's this one square. You can go there at any time, right on that corner uh, turn. Uh, and, and can the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership fix that? Sorry, I uh, <laughs> I lost the unmute button when when the screen share went up. Um, so um, about your first uh, issue, I am actually not sure. Um, uh, I, I'd have to check um, with with Regina and Belinda about which safety committee you're referring to. The the safety committee that I was referring to is actually a subcommittee of the Metro Tech. Um, board of directors already. So it was put out to existing um, board members to join. And we put it out to everyone. We also did some re outreach to um, some of the newer schools that it, so there's some charter schools and newer schools that are in the area that have um, been using uh, especially the commons um, as a play space. Um, and we've in, we've invited them. Um, and so I'm not sure, um, as far as I know, um, the NYCHA development is not within the Metro Tech bid and that's why they wouldn't be included. But again, I don't know if I'm referring to the same thing. So I, I'd have to get back to you on that because um, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of the, um, the hole that you were describing on the sidewalk, this is the first I'm hearing about it. I have heard about um, issues along uh, that specific corridor in terms of lighting, um, which we've reached out to DOT because we think that there's inadequate lighting, which has created some safety problems along that street. But I haven't seen this hole, but I'm going to have my operations team look at it tomorrow um, because um, it, that sounds really, really bad. Is it in the roadway or on the sidewalk? I guess is my first question. It, on the sidewalk, it's literally, it's a, a, an even square. Uh -huh. um, I don't know what was planted there. Be, something was there before. Either way, for years, we've been trying to get it addressed. You can ask the small little vendor truck, right? Yep. There, they'll show you where it's, I mean, it's visible. It's right there. I'm okay. Sure. I was literally there yesterday. I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm upset that I didn't see it. Um, but I will, I will look out for that and I will see what we can do. I mean, it, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a DOT issue, but um, but I will um, I guess I will follow up with Bill um, on this um, to get you an answer. Yeah, because neither property owner wants to take responsibility for it. So thank you. Um, and and oh, there was OK, but my, um, Ms. Morales, let me let someone else. Put my question, question. <laughs> I'll put, I'll put it in the chat. For, OK, put it in the chat. Uh, Mr. Nev uh, Neville, I believe you got a response in the chat. Okay, uh, so I, I did have a, an additional uh, uh, that, sir. This is for committee members first. Okay, cool. but we do see your message in the chat. Cool. Okay, you have a response. Okay, uh, Miss Peterson. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Denise Peterson. I'm co-chair to this uh, amazing committee, and I want to thank all my committee uh, co-members uh, for signing on tonight. And I want to also thank uh, the bids for their amazing presentations. I thought they were very good. They were very thorough and very informative. And so I learned some things myself. 
Um, and so I just wanted to thank all of you for taking out the time to participate in the meeting uh, this evening. And some of you, I will be looking forward to seeing this month. Um, and um, so we can have a greater conversation about what we can do moving forward in terms of the issues that you have that you have raised in the meeting. So uh, again, uh, thank you all uh, so very much. Um, I know that um, Mr. Darren Henry is on as well from the BEOC with some great information at the appropriate time, he will get to make some quick mentions uh, of, of there. And so I appreciate the fact that he signed on. Uh, I'm sure that he learned uh, equally as, as much as I did tonight. So thank all of you for participating. Okay, thank you, Mr. P Ms. Peterson. Uh, Kate Gilman has put some questions in the chat. This is something that we gave to the bids as far as uh, requests, as far as information you might want to respond to. Uh, she was uh, basically looking at climate resiliency. Uh, you can actually respond back to us uh, if you wish. Uh, but the thing that I am concerned about is landlord lease rates. One of the things I've noticed in this area is uh, lease rates have been going up and how are we addressing that? How are we helping individuals actually manage their leases? If anyone has an answer to that, I'd be more than happy to hear it. Yeah, I don't know if I have a thorough answer, but um, you know what I'll say is, as I mentioned in the presentation, we've seen our median asking rents go down for our commercial spaces just slightly over the last year or two. Um, so I would say, you know, I think most of our landlords understand that the power right now anyway in the market is with, with the business owner signing the lease. Um, in terms of our, our existing leases when heading into the pandemic, yeah, I was really, you know, for the most part, happy with how accommodating our, not happy, I guess I should say, um, satisfied with how accommodating our landlords were with our business owners making concessions, um, lease adjustments as needed, et cetera. Uh, I mean, we're fortunate because in our bid, obviously with the type of buildings that we have and ownership, it's a lot of you know mom and pop landlords. Um, so there's a lot more room maybe for accommodations like that. Um, also about a third of our, bus our businesses are in owner occupied spaces. So they own the building that they're in. So that's you know a really helpful um, tool to, to, for sustainability for businesses in their spaces. Um, so just sharing that, you know, we've seen rents go down slightly in the, in the asking price. I don't know how long, you know, that will continue, but um, for us, it's sort of working out well on that front. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, do any other committee members have any questions? Kate, you're up, what, Young? Thanks. Um, thank you all for the presentations. They were, as uh, Ms. Peterson said, super thorough and helpful. Um, one question I had was how involved um, are the bids or, or were you in sort of helping business owners either, you know, secure um, benefits that they were entitled to during COVID and, you know, on an ongoing basis, just I know there's a lot out there for MWBE and, you know, small business owners in the city, but it can be hard to navigate. So I'm just curious if you're, you know, a facilitator of sort of people getting, taking advantage of that. That's for anyone. Um, I'll, I'll pop I, in. I just came I, on uh, here, but I, at my previous bid, which was in Brownsville, Brooklyn and Pitkin Avenue, I did a lot of that work of assisting with getting uh, businesses um, through through the various uh, grant opportunities or, or funding opportunities through ASBA. We did a lot of outreach on that, um, and we also did some some programming that uh, through the New York Main Street that I did that would uh, work with MBE contractors as well. Um, Atlantic Avenue, <laughs> I'll tell you about that next year, maybe a little more. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Calvis. Uh, I was just going to say. Uh, not specifically for MWBE, but overall in the entire neighborhood, we shared a lot of resources for the PPE loans, the EIDL loans, uh, shuttered venue operator grant. Um, we definitely shared a lot of information, but I think to echo uh, what Jesse just said, most of our businesses seem to have uh, the capacity to take on the research uh, themselves. Um, 
you know, once or twice we got a, a few questions, but but overall in our bid, they were pretty uh, self-sufficient from that perspective. Um, I was going to add, similar to Jesse, like our staff, myself, we sat down and, you know, helped out applications with a lot of our business owners, but also wanted to give a shout out. I mean, for a number of the programs, it was very simple application, so that was easy to do. But for some of the things like PPP, which was much more involved, where you had to collect a lot of specific tax forms, uh, et cetera, we were able to connect business owners to BACnet, which has an office here in Fort Greene. So just wanted to give them a shout out that they were really helpful. A lot of our business owners shared that their staff um, were really accommodating and, and very great. Christina, I saw your hand raised. Yeah, um, I was just on that point, you know, we definitely work closely with some of our, our community partners like Impact Brooklyn, um, you know, and they were part of a citywide like free uh, group of attorneys and um, accountants and such that could offer more like one-on-one -on -one, um, dedicated like services and time with, with businesses that really needed it. Um, I would say one, one trend that we did see with some of the more like city and state programs, especially anything that was tied to like area median income, um, oh, most of Fulton Street in our district, you know, between Fort, Fort Greene with the me median income and household, household income increasing, and then also just seeing that in Clinton Hill as well too, that just automatically disqualified pretty much our whole district from those businesses receiving any of those types of grants or uh, zero interest loan programs that are being offered. And so that's definitely frustrating because I just, I don't see that as really like the, the area and neighborhood is changing in one way demographically for the people who live here, but that doesn't always necessarily mean that like the business owner matches that uh, high income level as well too. Um, and so there were just programs that they just couldn't, couldn't qualify for, but were still very, very much needed and could have used that extra support. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question to that uh, question, uh, whether or not you actually received PPE funding, okay? You did apply for it, but did you actually receive it as far as your different, uh, different company, uh, different working store fronts and everything else as far as that they actually get the money that they actually applied for? And it sounds like for your particular uh, bid, it did not happen. Okay. Um, I'm looking for one person. If, if Mr. Flanoy? Yes. Hey, I'm aware that uh, our friends from Dumbo and North Flatbush and possibly others have to jump off for another obligation tonight. Are there any closing questions for North Flatbush or Dumbo in particular? Okay, I'm going to let Lindsay Einhorn have the last question. Lindsay, are you still here? Okay, I believe she just jumped off just as I was about to ask. Okay, any other questions? Okay, with that, thank you very much. Okay, um, I'll probably be following up with you later on this month asking any other questions that may come up and do some follow-up with you all. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, this has been uh, very educational for the committee. Okay, and hope to see you again next year <laughs> with better news. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll go to the next item on the agenda, which is item number seven. Okay, chairperson's report. Um, I'm going to basically say, uh, currently right now, we're gonna be working on the information we just received. And other than that, um, hopefully the committee members, I'm gonna allow you all the opportunity at the next meeting that any ideas or information you have that you've done research on, if you wish to share that, I'll give you that opportunity at the next committee meeting. Okay, uh, any other committee, uh, any business right now? Item number seven, number eight. Okay. Uh, community forum. Okay. Is there anyone who would like to speak at the community forum?
Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Flanoy, I believe Mr. Henry, as I indicated yesterday, I don't hear him saying anything, um, wanted to make some mentions of his program at BEOC. So Mr. Henry, are you still I connected? I do not see. Uh, see I'm okay. back. I couldn't yeah. unmute that. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute that. Yes, no mic. problem. Yeah, I was asking for you to yeah. speak. That was your moment. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Peterson, for having me. Thank you for attending our partnership meeting on last week. We greatly appreciate it. And I'm not going to be before you long. I'm just going to share a little update with you about the BELC. And um, I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Um, I don't have many slides. So. Um, for those of you that are um, not familiar, we're right in your backyard. We're actually at um, 111 Livingston Street um, across from the old Board of Education, which are now, I guess, condos. Um, and we've been around since 1966. We provide tuition free training. Mr. Mr. Henry? Yes. We're actually looking at your entire computer desktop at the moment. I'm trying to open. Oh, oh. There we go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank we can you. See it now. All right, so let me get to the first slide. It's only like three slides, really. Um, just to give you a little background, we are funded by the State um, University of New York, and we are administered by City Tech. So it is a partnership between SUNY and CUNY. Um, the EOCs actually go from Buffalo to Long Island, and the, um, the uh, EOCs in the borough, there were no SUNY campuses when we opened, so we were all assigned to a CUNY campus. So in our case, we report to City Tech, but uh, Manhattan reports to BMCC, for example. But if you were in Buffalo, you would be reporting maybe to the University of Buffalo. Um, we enroll up to 1,600 students annually, and our programs are tuition free. And they're classified as academic career and short term training. And this is who we're looking for. Um, I heard someone mention NYCHA. We're actually meeting, uh, we're a partner with NYCHA, but we actually have another meeting coming up with them on Friday. Um, but we're looking for individuals that are 18 years of age or older or 17 with a high school diploma, US citizen, permanent resident, or refugee. Um, they must have lived in New York for at least one year. And we're looking for individuals that are low to moderate income. And our career programs in college prep require a high school diploma or GED. And we look for individuals with fewer than 33 college credits. Um, when the ELCs were founded, they were actually college prep programs. And over the years, they evolved into various types of programs and training, which are normally um, based on the local economy. And here are the programs that are offered. All right, so we do ESL and high school equivalency and college preparation. Uh, we are an approved GED test site as well for our students. We haven't opened to the public yet, but our students are eligible to um, test on site. Um, we are approved CUNY college preparation program. Our students should not be a remedial student when they enter into any of the CUNY campuses. Um, we do medical assisting and medical billing. Um, office administrative professional, which is teaching individuals to become Microsoft Office certified and also working in the cloud. Uh, we're relaunching tourism and hospitality. So those of you dealing with the restaurants and everything, we're coming back with our program as well, uh, which included customer service, restaurant management, and food handlers. Um, mm -hmm. Our medical e-records has been suspended for the spring. And then we also have um, OSHA and security guard training. Um, all the programs are tuition free. We do provide tutoring. We provide job placement assistance as well um, to our students. Um, referral services, if there are um, things going on in our students' lives that maybe we're not equipped to deal with, then we have the resources to connect them with various agencies, various agencies throughout the city. Um, real quickly, you'll see in the last column, we do have a number of programs starting on March 31st. So, um, so if you know anyone who's looking to get into a program, if you're working in the schools, you're working in the churches and you have um, aging out students or you have the parents of some of the students that need to upgrade their skills, um, we are looking for um, students for HSC, college preparation, ESL, the office administrative professional program and the direct um, support professional, which is working with the mentally and physically challenged actually. Um, most of these programs will lead to industry certifications. And in most cases, we cover the cost of the certification as well. And then the last two, Ocean Security Guard. These programs are offered three to four times per semester. So this isn't like a one and done with Security Guard in Ocean. 
And here's our contact information. And I will put a flyer in the chat box as well for you that you can feel free to share. We're available to do presentations in your other civic groups or on your job. If you're in um, education, social service, whatever your industry is, if you think there's a need for individuals to get the training that we provide for free, um, we're on board with that. So um, Ms. Peterson, again, thank you for having me tonight. And I really enjoyed the meeting. You know, I, I work in downtown Brooklyn, but I'm not a you know, community member, technically, I guess. Uh, but it's just really exciting to hear like all the things that you guys are working on. So keep up the good work. And I, I really do appreciate it. Even as a Newark resident who is slowly transitioning over to becoming like Brooklyn, um, I, I really do um, appreciate the work you're doing. So appreciate you. Thank you and good luck. Hey, thank you, Darren. Appreciate all right. You okay. Uh, Mr. Neville, if you wish to speak, you can speak now. Thank you so much. I apologize for uh, my hastiness earlier. I just want to introduce myself to everyone. My name is Neville Louison. Uh, I am born, raised, and still live in Brooklyn, a uh, proud resident of Fort Greene uh, for over 13 years. Uh, I'm a writer, uh, and I've written an ebook about my experiences with race in America. Uh, but more importantly, what I'm really uh, would like to offer to the community is my experience for the last 15 years uh, at American Express, Salesforce, and Sprinkler, Microsoft, um, as just a resource to be able to speak more about my experiences as a Black small business owner. Uh, I have a digital storefront on Amazon. You can check out the storefront. It's uh, amazon.com slash soulful silverback. And I have a vision for the community from a future perspective as we look at the legislation for as cannabis rolls out uh, to leverage my retail experience across those uh, large major retailers, uh, sorry, businesses to bring that expertise to cannabis to help fill retail locations, but also really sponsor and spur job opportunities in the neighborhood as well. So I've written uh, this ebook, it's entitled Chading Day, and wanted to introduce myself and offer that idea um, to the committees to see if there was any thought around filling those retail locations with that. And with that, I will uh, be quiet. When nice to meet y'all. Not a problem. Mr. Lewison, if, if you've noticed, we've actually put some information in the chat and also the committees, we're gonna be exploring this also, uh, the HES committee and also this committee. So, okay, you. it might be to your interest, best interest to actually attend those meetings and actually hear what is also being presented to the committee as a well. whole. I have and will continue. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, anything else? Any other people and individuals who wish to speak at the committee, uh, committee forum? Okay, seeing none. That brings us to item 10 on the agenda. That's to adjourn. <laughs> May I have a motion to adjourn? Okay, Ms. Peterson. Okay, Ms. Morales. Okay, thank you so much. This has been a very, very informative and helpful meeting. Okay, uh, Ms. Uh, Taya, thank you very much for organizing this. Again, as always, out of the park. Thank you. Okay, you can now end the recording. <laughs>